All right. So today, as promised, probably the most important day in any statics class is rigid body equilibrium. So this essentially, uh, the last seven or eight days have been building up to being able to do this. And then everything we do after this is pretty much based on this. So that's why I said it's probably the most important uh, thing to know for statics. Um, and also for your future classes as well. A lot of your future, future classes will depend on you being able to do uh, what we're going to see today. So rigid body equilibrium is very similar to particle equilibrium. Uh, the difference being that a particle was just one single point. So one single point, uh, don't care about rotation. Uh, rigid body equilibrium, rigid bodies, assuming it's an, an extended body. So it has a definite shape, definite volume. And so where I apply those forces is going to do different things. If I apply a force to this side of the pencil, it's going to push it up that way. If I apply it to the side, it's going to push it up that way, cause diff different rotations. So uh, that is what rigid body equilibrium is. And so it kind of starts off with particle equilibrium. So for particle, if it doesn't move left and right, if it doesn't move up and down, then it's stable, it's not going anywhere. For a rigid body, it can't move left and right, it can't move up and down, and it also can't rotate. So there's an additional constraint there due to rotation. So for particle equilibrium, all we cared about were the forces. So some of all the forces have to add up to zero. Uh, we still need that because we still need it to not move left and right or up and down. But we also need the sum of the moments to equal zero if the sum of the moments equals zero, that means it's not going to rotate. So no rotation, no movement means it's in equilibrium. So today we're gonna to stay in two dimensions. So just kind of X, Y directions. In two, in two dimensions, don't have anything, any forces in the Z direction. So don't need to worry about that. And as we talked about with moments, if I have a moment in just the X, Y plane, then that really is only one moment that's around the Z axis. And so to get to equilibrium, again, nothing moving left and right. So no movement left and right means that all my forces in the X direction add up to zero using standard X, Y coordinates. All um, no movement up and down means that all my forces in the y direction equal zero. So again, that's the same as particle equilibrium. But then we also have this third constraint of no rotation. And no rotation means um, some of all the moments technically in the z direction um, add up to zero as well. And for this guy, um, technically, again, in the xy plane, all your moments are going to be in the z direction. If you remember going back to the moment lecture, and so this Z down here um, is optional. I usually don't write it. Um, it's going to be important when we get to 3D. That's the next lecture. So um, day 10 lecture, we'll talk about 3D. But for 2D, I usually don't bother writing Z down here because I know it's in the Z direction. Uh, but I do have this other subscript. This other subscript being what point I'm taking my moment around. So remember, I can take the moment around any point I want. Um, so whatever point I take it around, I want to make a note of what that is. That's going to give me different distances, different equations. So I want to make sure I write down um, what moment I'm actually talking about. And for equilibrium in terms of rotation, um, it doesn't actually matter what point you take the moment around. If I want to take it around the left side, right side, center, as long as whatever moment that is, as long as that is zero, it will the whole body will not rotate. So here's my three equations of equilibrium. So for any two-dimensional object, it needs to have no force in x, no force in y, and no moment around any point. If all those three equations are satisfied, that object is in equilibrium. Now that's not the only choice I have. Um, I have other choices as well. Um, taking the moment around two different points, I can get two different equations. And by doing so, um, that's another option I have. So I can take, for example, the moment around point A, as well as the moment around point B, and then my third equation being the force in the X direction, I'll add up to zero. And that will also give me um, equilibrium. So those will also mean that the body does not move left and right, body does not move up and down, and body does not rotate. There's one kind of caveat with this. And so body not moving left and right, that's covered with sum of forces equals zero in the X direction. Um, 
body not rotating that's covered by either one of these two equations. Doesn't matter which one it is. But then not moving up and down. Um, so these three equations, if you want to use just one force and two moments, um, point A and point B, this kind of assumes that those are on a horizontal line. So I have some horizontal beam or maybe my horizontal pencil, and then point A is one end, point B is the other end. If there's no rotation around point A and no rotation around point B, that actually means this thing is not going to move up and down. So by having those two moment equations that lie along a horizontal line, that covers no movement up and down. So that's why these three equations are completely equivalent to the three we had before. Um, similarly, if I want to do force in the y direction, I can do that too. But in that case, I'm going to need A and B to be on a vertical line. So if I have some other object that um, has some extension up and down, if A and B are on a vertical line, then I can take the moment around point A and the moment around point B and the force in the y direction. And that way, the force in the y direction stops any movement up and down. The moments stop rotation. And in that case, we're also going to stop uh, horizontal movements. So again, I'll have all three conditions satisfied. This body is not going to move, so it will be in equilibrium. And then last option, as long as points A, B, and C are not all on the same line, you can actually write three moment equations and around these three different points, and those will also cover not moving left and right, not moving up and down, and not rotating. So that's the third option, um, or fourth option, however you're counting this, to actually write down the equations of equilibrium in two dimensions. One thing to realize, no matter which way you plan on doing it, uh, for each individual case, there was only three equations. So force in X, force in Y, and one moment, or one force and two moments, or all three moments. Whichever way it was, there was only three equations because we're only trying to stop three motions. So a lot of times, or maybe not a lot of times, but a few times in this class, um, you're gonna see certain scenarios where you might actually have more than three unknowns. So three equations, most I can do to solve for are three unknowns. Um, certain scenarios we'll see in a week or two, you're gonna have more than three unknowns. So you might wanna write down uh, more than three equations. So for example, force in the X direction equals zero, force in the Y direction equals zero, some of the moments around some point A equals zero, and some of the moments around point B equal zero. I mean, you can write down all those four equations, that's fine. The problem is when you go to solve them, as long as you don't make any algebraic mistakes, uh, when you go to solve them, you will probably end up with zero equals zero because stuff's going to cancel out. Because if you do do this, um, they're not going to be linearly independent because they're all kind of dependent on the geometry. And so that, that geometry makes them um, linearly dependent on each other. So even though it looks like you'll be able to write down as many equations as you want, um, officially, you can only write down up to three because anything more than that, um, you can actually derive using the other three equations. So again, if you do that properly, you'll end up with zero equals zero, which doesn't help you at all. Uh, the worst case scenario is if you do it wrong. So if you make an algebraic mistake in there somewhere, you won't end up with zero equals zero. You'll end up with some answer and that answer will most likely be wrong. So maximum number of unknowns for a two-dimensional system is three, even though you can write down more equations, um, don't do it because they're actually not gonna help you. And so in the problem solving process, the first thing you wanna do is draw the free body diagram for the object. Now here, um, it's gonna be very similar to what we did for the particle case, but in this case, um, the actual shape really matters. So dimensions matter, uh, where those um, forces are located matter. Uh, for a particle, there's all at the same point, but here, you know, if there's a force on the left or a force on the right, make sure it's drawn in the right location, um, or at least along its line of action um, at the right point. Another part of the free body diagram is, so I talk about um, all these unknowns and having three unknowns. Um, what are these unknowns that I'm talking about? So usually I have a structure and that structure is supported in a certain way. So it either has some sort of connection, it's sitting on the ground or it's um, connected to, to some pins or there's some cables or ropes attached to it that are holding it up. And so those are essentially your unknowns is how much tension is in that cable, how much normal force is holding the thing above the ground. Um, those are generally these um, unknowns that I'm talking about. So those are the things that I can have a maximum of three of. If I have more than that, um, there's other things we can do that we'll see in a few weeks. But for now, um, in two-dimensional systems, you're generally gonna have three of these things, um, these supports, 
that will become reaction forces that are holding up your structure. And so a lot of times what you're given is just kind of a drawing of here's my object and here's its supports, um, not necessarily in words, but in pictures. And so you want to be able to translate those pictures of what the support is into um, reaction forces. And so here's a common diagram um, showing you kind of what these reaction forces do. So just like the equilibrium equations, I want things not to move left and right, not to move up and down, not to rotate. The supports generally do one or more of those things. So if I'm looking at, um, there's things called rollers. Rollers are usually given by a little triangle with three little wheels under it, or it's given by one big wheel. Um, so rollers obviously can roll, meaning they can move, um, in this case, left or right. And so they're not going to stop any movement left or right, but there is ground here. They are going to stop things moving for, um, through the floor, so they will stop any movement up and down. And so anytime I have a roller, I can replace that by a reaction force in the vertical direction in this case. So whichever way is perpendicular to the rollers, um, that's the way my reaction force goes. So if I have a structure on the bottom with some rollers, I can basically, for the free body diagram, throw away those rollers and replace it with one force um, again, perpendicular to which way those wheels are going. Same thing for rockers. Uh, rockers can rock back and forth, so they don't stop any movement left and right, um, as it's drawn here, but it will stop movement up and down, so again, again same scenario. Uh, frictionless surface, no friction, so this thing's free to slide left and right, but it won't fall through the floor, so again, vertical reaction force. So again, if I'm drawing a free body diagram for this scenario, throw away the floor, replace it with... Um, one reaction force holding it up. And then cables, like we saw on day four, any sort of reaction force goes along that same direction as the cable. Uh, for a cable, um, it has to be in tension, so the cable needs to be pulling on it. A cable can't push on things. And so I have one reaction force in the pulling direction for a cable. Uh, short link is similar to a cable, um, but it's more like a solid cable. So instead of just being able to pull, a short link can actually also push on things. Um, but you can only push in that same direction. So whatever angle this short link makes, the reaction force goes in that same direction. But in this case, it could be either up to the left or down to the right because it had to be pulling or pushing. But again, only one reaction force, um, no matter what is happening there. So this next case is a bit of an interesting one, either a collar on a frictionless rod or a frictionless pin in a slot. So again, frictionless rod means there's going to be no um, force that's acting against any motion up and down the rod or no force acting in the direction of the slot. So this, there's nothing stopping this thing from sliding up and down in that direction, but the collar itself or the slot itself will stop the um, collar or the pin from jumping out of the slot or jumping off the bar. So there's no way this collar can move perpendicular to the bar. It can only slide up and down. So there's a force stopping it from going in the perpendicular direction. So in either case, I have this one force in the perpendicular direction to the slot or the collar, um, stopping it from that motion, but nothing in the parallel direction. Now notice here that this bar is um, pinned to the collar. That, that's what this little dot means here. And this obviously is a pin. Um, pins are actually the next case. But what we're going to see there is that a pin's kind of you have kind of a slot and you put a pin through it and then that's how it's connected. So if I kind of think of my fingers holding this pencil, um, there's a pin through my finger and my thumb. And so um, it's gonna stop this thing from moving left and right. I can't push it left and right. I can't move it up and down, but I can rotate it. So that pin inside there can rotate. So there is no, um, there's nothing preventing any rotation in this case. If on the other hand, this, this second bar here that's attached to the collar, if that was rigidly attached to it, so if that was welded to the collar, or if that was, you know, taped to it, or anything other than pinned to it, then um, I wouldn't be able to rotate this bar. So the fact I can rotate this bar here is because of this pin connection onto the collar. Again, if that was rigid, I would not be able to rotate that. And if I would, if I'm not able to rotate that, that means this is causing another um, support condition that's causing me to stop rotating it. If I can't rotate it, then there's a additional moment 
a re called a reaction moment that is applied kind of like in this last case that we'll get to. So there's something that's stopping me from rotating it. So just like the floor stops me from moving through the floor, so I put a reaction force on it. If this guy is welded, there's a reaction moment that stops me from being able to um, rotate it. Then again, next case, as I said, pins. Uh, pins can stop motion left and right, um, but they can't stop rotational motion. So there's two reaction forces, a force in the X direction and a force in the Y direction. Um, alternatively, you can have one force at an angle, but uh, I generally never do that, mainly because if you remember the equations of equilibrium, I had force in the X direction, force in the Y direction. So I'd much rather have that force broken down into X and Y components so I can easily put it into my uh, X and Y equations. So I always write it as two, two unknowns, X and Y forces, as opposed to two unknowns, one magnitude in one direction. Same thing obviously happens for a rough surface. A rough surface means there is friction. So if there is friction, I'm again gonna have this reaction force in the X direction, as well as the normal force um, from the ground holding it up. And the last case scenario is a fixed support. So that's something actually stuck into the wall or stuck into the ground. So if you bury a pole uh, into the ground, uh, that ground's gonna stop it from moving left and right. Ground's gonna stop it from moving up and down. The ground's also, also gonna stop, move it, stop it from um, rotating. So this rotates a little bit because my hand's not that great. Um, but if I push on it here, I'm not gonna cause any rotation, even though I'm applying a moment to it. That's not gonna make this thing rotate because the ground is providing a counter moment um, to stop it from rotating. So in this case, I have no motion in the X direction, so a reaction force there, no motion in the Y direction, so a reaction force there. And again, this stops it from rotating, so a reaction moment as well. So again, whatever one, whichever one of these drawings you see to draw the free body diagram, just basically replace it with the appropriate uh, reaction conditions, the appropriate amount of reaction forces and moments for that scenario. Now, some of these may seem a little silly, like especially these rollers. Um, I always kind of joke that my building's on roller skates. And so why would you ever make a building and put it on roller skates? That seems kind of ridiculous. Um, but that has actually done, and it's actually done quite a bit um, in real life, mainly due to things like thermal expansion. So if you have um, a big bridge, for, big bridge, for example, um, a lot of these concrete pads will have um, finger joints in them that kind of go in and go out. You'll probably see those as you dry over them. And in the summertime, they're probably really close together. Wintertime, they're probably fairly far apart because again, thermal expansion, these huge pieces of concrete um, actually expand and contract with temperature. And so a lot of cases you need to take that into account, especially on very large structures. And so there's ways to do that. Um, so here's some actual real life physical conditions that actually mimic things like rollers and rockers uh, pin connections and fixed um, connections as well. So even though some of them may seem ridiculous, I, again, joke about having roller skates on a building. Um, it, it does actually make sense. So again, general procedure, kind of summing up uh, what we were going to do for these um, two-dimensional equilibrium equations. First thing to do uh, for any problem is draw the free body diagram. So take your object, um, get rid of all the supports, get rid of the ground, get rid of cables, get rid of uh, rollers, rockers, whatever they are, and replace them with their appropriate um, reaction forces and or moments. Um, include any dimensions if you need them, because again, this is going to matter in terms of moments, um, what those distances are. And then label all your forces and moments so you have all your external forces, um, as well as all these support reactions that you've also added in now as well. Then once you have your free body diagram, you can write down your equations of equilibrium. So you can use uh, any three equations you want. Again, whether it's force in the X direction, force in the Y direction, and moment around some point, or force in one direction and two moments around two different points, or all three moment equations. Um, so that's going to give you um, three equations for up to three unknowns. Um, sometimes you'll have less than three unknowns, in which case you only need two of the equations, but a lot of times you'll need all three equations. Um, so essentially, you end up in a scenario where you have uh, three equations and three unknowns. And at that point, it might be just tempting to just plug it into a fancy calculator and just solve it. Um, but part of this class is actually knowing that there's easier ways to do things. And as, you, as you'll as you see, um, a lot of times 
when I go through examples, the first thing I do is actually write down a moment equation and solve that because a lot of times I can get a moment equation and that moment equation will have only one unknown in it. And if it has only one unknown in it, I can solve for it as opposed to if I have forces in X and Y as well as one moment, I'll probably have two or three unknowns in all three equations and that's gonna be kind of hard to solve. If I can get one equation with only one unknown, I can solve for that one unknown. And then now that I know that, um, I can write down another equation and that might have um, just one new unknown in it now that I have that value of the first unknown. And so there is definitely a way to do this that's better than others. Um, and there's definitely ways to do it that's better than just plugging into a fancy solver that solves three equations and three unknowns. And that is part of this class. Um, and that kind of comes into the fact that moments can be taken around any point. So part of this class is being clever, figuring out which point's the best point to take. Um, in terms of my moments so that I only have one unknown, I can then solve for it and then I can write down either another moment equation or a force equation and solve for a new unknown, then get the third equation, solve for the third unknown, um, as opposed to having to use a fancy calculator. So that is um, some of uh, the procedure we'll see for a lot of the examples that we'll see during class today. So be sure to come to that. As I said, um, it's fairly important stuff. And um, the next video will involve actually some harder details of this. So this is all two-dimensional for now. We'll deal with some kind of harder two-dimensional cases as well as three-dimensional cases uh, in the next video.